May the meditations of my mouth and, the, uh, and those of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I promised a second sermon on courage. And if you were listening to the Exodus text, you know where I am going with this. Uh, today's texts give us, though, I want to point out, the confluence of two central narratives, uh, the Exodus story and then Christ our Messiah, yes, Christ our Savior. So. If you are intrigued with that, I have a book recommendation to start off with because I cannot talk about all of the things much as I would dearly like to. Uh, Michael Goldberg wrote a book called Getting Our Stories Straight. And he talks about the narrative of the Exodus uh, in which Israel is led out of slavery into freedom. And then uh, the Christian narrative as found in Matthew, where we are freed from sin, right? He parallels those two things, and it is a great read. So that I offer that for you. Uh, and then I want to talk about this Exodus passage. And I have been, and I'm going to take a side note just to say, isn't that a good sound to hear in church on a Sunday morning? Such a blessing, right? We are blessed by the presence of our young people. Uh, I look at the courage of these midwives in the Exodus, and I wonder about them. Right? Courage uh, <laughs> is a danger. I, I, I think I, it would be a thing I am cautious about aspiring to. Right? Because those situations that call for courage get hard quickly. And this text is super interesting in a whole bunch of ways, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them. The first is that you may know that in the Bible, we name, we get the names of important people. And so, we have an unnamed Pharaoh in this text. And that's the first thing to notice, right? And scholars actually differ as to when they think this text would have taken place. So he's unnamed in the text and we don't know who he is. And that's remarkable. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter is also unnamed in the text. But we get a parallel. There's a reason for that. We get a parallel, the daughter of Pharaoh, right? And then the daughter of Levi. And they, both of them, each in their separate spheres, are going to be working for the safety of Moses who will then be able to lead God's people to freedom, right? Uh, we know, though, Moses' sister. That's Miriam. We know her from other places in the text as a prophet and a leader in her own right. We know Moses' mother also from other places in the texts. Um, and then we have, of course, Moses' name, and we have the names of the midwives. Uh, and the text gives you Shipra, sometimes it's Shifra pronounced, uh, and then Pua. And I don't know that those names roll off our lips as easily as some of the other names in our texts. Uh, but, but I think... They deserve to be familiar to us. Uh, this text fulfills a birth narrative of an important person. So if you look at uh, stories about prominent figures in the ancient world, they often have a significant birth narrative. 
And I think that's some of what this text is doing. But it gives us this remarkable set of interactions between this very powerful but unnamed pharaoh and these two midwives. And they don't so much speak truth to power as lie in its face. Which does take a certain kind of nerve, doesn't it? And we have their names, their profession, their courage, and God's response to their courage. Based on their names, we can speculate that they were also Hebrews. And we don't know the time lapse between the interactions. It's one verse in our story. The Pharaoh gives them the instruction to kill the male babies. And then almost right away, he's calling them to account. Why have you not been following this instruction? And it would have had to have been long enough for him to notice that the numbers were not declining, right? So we don't, this story is tightly narrated. Uh, and the midwives do something interesting. First of all, scholars think probably they were the head of a whole passel of midwives, right? Just by the sheer size of the population that they would have been serving. These two women stand in for a whole group of women who would have served as midwives. Uh, and their response to Pharaoh when he wants to know, why are you not killing these babies, is to play into Pharaoh's own bias and say, well, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. And they just pop those babies out before we ever even get there. The word they use to describe them doesn't happen anywhere else in the text, but it, it sounds a lot like another word that has a, an animal-related meaning. So they're basically saying, yeah, they're wild. They're, they're undomesticated women, and they just pop the babies out. And apparently this flies. Uh, and then we have God's response. And that's really interesting too, because we are told that they will be heads of dynasties, uh, which is the same promise David gets. And if they were married, their male head of household is not here mentioned in this, in this promise from God in response to what they are described as being, which is God-fearing. Uh, so this text gives us this picture of these sort of ancient professionals of deep courage, and I wonder about how they're calling to hold that role of midwife in their community played into their ability to be wise, right? The, to, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it says they feared the Lord. And so they did not carry out this immoral order. Uh, and so I wonder about this idea that having been called and trusted in a community, they were in a particular frame of, of being that allowed them to have clarity and courage. Um, Frederick Buechner writes that vocation is the place where your deep gladness 
and the world's deep hunger meet. Right? And we don't know a lot about these particular women, but we do, we can make some guesses based on their profession about who they were, the kinds of people that they were, right? Because to be a midwife is not a thing all of us would do well. Uh, it requires a willingness to deal with the messiness and unpredictability of birth. It requires being willing to respond. I mean, babies don't always come on a timetable, right? So you have to be willing to put other things on hold, sometimes at kind of short notice. Um, and this made me think about our text today in Romans and other places actually in Paul's letters where he talks about the ways in which we are gifted for different roles, different callings, different moments in our lives. Uh, if you think back over your life, you may notice that your experiences formed you in a way that then enabled you to face off against the next thing. Not always, but, but, and sometimes it takes a while to look back in appreciation for those forming experiences. Um, so, being a midwife has actually throughout time sometimes been a bit of a risky business. Uh, and this plays out in our own world where actually you'll hear periodically hospitals closing their maternity wards. It's a very expensive part of the practice of medicine because it is high risk even now. And I don't have answers, but I will point you toward a problem, and that is this. In our technologically advanced and assisted world, in this country, maternal mortality, the likelihood that a woman will die in or adjacent to childbirth, that number has actually been going up. And that's appalling. So this is a, a role that takes clarity of priorities and courage of its own, really. And with that in mind, I wonder if you think about the things to which you have been called in this life at different moments. And sometimes that might be what you have done for work, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, right? The, th the situations into which we are called are the places where we serve and it feeds us and it serves the world. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, if you haven't read Frederick Bigner, I, I recommend him also, because he gives these short, pithy descriptions of uh, different, aspect, different vocabulary. And so he says, for example, if it gives you deep joy to write advertising jingles, that might meet only one of the two criteria. Uh, because that might not be a deep need of the world. So... I want to invite you to reflect on the roles in which you have been called, the qualities that you hold, and I know we, we have a tendency to, to a false modesty sometimes, but you are all of you good at some things, right? So being honest about the things which you do or have done well 
and then thinking about how they equip you now and for whatever might be next is a great exercise. And then I invite you to think about what, is the, what are the things that you carry, the physical implements that are related to the ways in which you are called as we go into this new school year. Uh, because next week we are blessing implements of work. And we will be blessing backpacks for sure. Uh, but we, all of us, are called, and this is the good news, right? That we are all of us called. And, and, um, and I will tell you personally that there was a moment in my life where it was much, much easier to see how other people might be being called. So if you're not sure, ask a friend. They'll be able to tell you you're amazing at, right? If you are not sure. Uh, and then, hopefully next week, Saturday, set yourself an alert on your phone. Put something in your car to bring so that we can bless all of the ways in which we will go into this fall serving our world. Amen.